We're going to call today's show Blah, Blah, Blah. Have you ever had a friend or someone telling you a story and they seem to extend the story and you want to tell them, all right, I heard that, get to the point. Well, the same thing happens on websites or documents and presentations. So in today's show, I'm going to give you some tips so you won't be one of those people that are going blah, blah, blah. Welcome to another edition of Computer Train. It's time for Computer Train, the weekly TV program that trains you how to use your computer. With your host, El Paso Community College faculty member, Russ Myers. So as I said, in today's show, we are going to get to the blah, blah, blah part. And I hope in all of my shows, I haven't been one of those people that have done that. And I've given you some good information and to the point information. But before we do that, in our previous shows, we were doing some networking examples. And in my previous show, I had quite a few examples. And I still had a couple more things that I wanted to show you. But I felt like I was on the gong show and my producer was yanking me off the stage. So I'm just going to take about three to five minutes and discuss a couple of last things related to networking, and then we'll get into the meat of this uh, today's uh, show. So we were talking about uh, web addresses where, where we type it in. We type in www.epcc.edu, but computers use a numbering system, and then I showed you about uh, binary, and I'm going to show you a little bit more about that today. One of the things that you can do is you can use a command that we used to use in DOS. DOS was the operating system, this operating system, that was uh, from Microsoft before we're all familiar with the Windows. Uh, the real one that I started using was around Windows 3.1. But you can still get to the command prompt. So I haven't shown you that in the show before, so I just want to show you that. It's not something the average person would really get into. We don't need that anymore. Usually uh, we've got the Windows operating system to do everything. But I want to show you how to do it. So to find it, I'm in Windows 10, remember, so I can come down here and click on the box. We're going to use Cortana to search for it. And it's called the command prompt. So if we just start typing in a couple of those letters for the word command, you'll see that we found it. Okay, so we're going to go to the command prompt. And a side note is kind of what I'm showing you what you know it used to be like for us. Uh, before the nice Windows graphical system. Now we have menus and dialog boxes and icons and a, a lot of nice things to make computers much easier to use. But back in the old days, this is all we had. All you had was a blinking cursor and you had to type your own commands. So in this show, I've shown you how to use File Explorer to look at your folders and drives. Uh, we could do the same thing back then. Let's see if I can remember a couple of the commands. Uh, to see a list of, let's see, to go back to a drive, I think it's E colon, which is my drive. No, let me double check my drive real quick here. That's why it's much better now. All right, so it's the D drive. So let me see if we can go to the D drive. Okay, so that's how you change drives. So now, of course, you just have icons with the drives labeled C drive, D drive, F drive, whatever you have. To get a list of your files, you would use the dir command. OK, so here are folders that are on my flash drive. OK, to get to one of those folders, I believe it was cd for change directory. And let's see if I can go to one, epcc files. And then I could do a directory there. OK, so you can see back in those times, you could do the ex exact same things, but it was much more cumbersome. A command to clear the screen, I remember, was CLS. There we go. All right, so one of the commands that they use in the networking classes is a ping command, and it basically sends a signal out to the website that you're talking about, and it will return the, the numerical system just to get, uh, teach students about how it works. So I'm going to use the ping command, and I'm going to see if we can ping Google, Google's website. Okay, so you can see here the ping command was set, uh, successful, so it sent the signal out to that website, and it replied. So here is the number associated. I don't think I can copy from this. That's kind of a drag, so I'll have to, oh, maybe I can. We'll see. All right, so now if I put that into the website, oh, nice, it did do a copy. All right, so now instead of putting in google.com like we would do and epcc.edu, I've put the actual IP address. Remember, we we're talking about the language of the Internet, Internet Protocol. And you see it went to, it went to Google's website. 
Okay, so the actual website is google.com. And so see, these are some of the things that we use in the networking classes to teach students about how information actually gets from one computer to another all the way across the world. Another thing you can do is in Google or in your web address, you can type my IP with a space, and it'll return the IP address that you're on. Okay, so here is my IP address. Okay, so remember that's all the numerical system. The other thing that we were describing is the numerical system. This is the base 10 system, which is the numbers that we use, 0 through 9, the 1s, the 10s, the 100s, the 1000s, etc. But computers use different numbering systems, and one of the main ones it uses is binary. It uses that binary code to keep track of numbers and letters. So one of the things I wanted to show you is how to convert from one to the other. And sometimes I uh, do things with my family related to computers to try to make them figure it out. So one year I sent my uh, wife an e-card, which I'll show you. And I sent her a message, but I put it all in binary. And so I wanted her to take that binary and then convert it to the actual message. Okay, so to do that, we need a binary to text converter. So we'll say text to binary. Okay, letters and numbers are kept by the computer. All right, so here looks like a good website. Perfect. All right, so nice little box. I type the message in here in normal words, and it'll convert it to the actual binary. So remember that um, there's the characters are related to in uh, stored in bytes. So we've talked about that in File Explorer. File sizes are measured in bytes. Storage capacities are measures, measured in bytes. And there's eight bits to a byte. So we were talking about that. Each bit is the zero or the one, whether it's on or off. So I sent her a happy Valentine's one time. I put Bart. Sometimes she calls me Bart because uh, apparently I'm a little bit sarcastic at times like the character on The Simpsons, Bart Simpson, so once in a while she calls me Bart. So what you see down here is you see the binary equivalent for every single character. So the H right here is this first set of eight bits. The A is this set of eight bits, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, including the spaces, okay? So when we get down to the Y, this seventh character, the space, that's in here also. Every single character has to be represented in this binary, including the spaces, the comma, if you put a dash, anything. So then what I did is I copied this binary code, and I went to an e-card website. Most of the e-card websites are free. So I've picked a card here. And then usually you can customize the card and put some text in. So that's usually where you put the regular message, but of course I'm not regular. And what I did is I gave her a message like this. Okay, had many more, many more characters in it, but it was just a bunch of zeros and ones. And of course, on her side, when she got it, it was just a big question mark, like, what did you send me? I don't think it worked properly. I said, no, 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 it worked properly. I sent you binary code. You have to go to a binary text converter, copy that binary, and it'll re reveal the text. So, you know, my whole life, every single day from sunup to sundown is spent with computers. So, of course, I'm going to incorporate that into other things. Okay, so that's enough of the networking stuff and the binary. If you want to learn more, take a class here at El Paso Community College. So, let's get to the real topic for today, which is about that blah, blah, blah. When someone is telling you a story, and unfortunately, I have to bring my wife into it because she is one of those people. It could be something very, very simplistic that happened in her day. And she'll come home and say, well, do you know who I saw today? No, who'd you see today? So you're thinking it's going to be the name right away and a quick answer. But no, it usually starts off, well, I was driving at Walmart. Gosh, it was really windy today. There was cars, you know, going in and out everywhere. Anyway, so then I'm driving in this, and then I saw this, oh, this red car pulled out in front of me. So the story goes from who did I see today to who knows what and her entire episode at Walmart. So what happens is I'm going through some training right now through our online training services, and I'm really finding some good information. I've actually been teaching online classes for at least about 10 years now. So I'm pretty good at it, but I think there's many more things that I could learn, and I'm discovering there's a lot more that I could learn, especially how to present the information where everyone can get it. 
One of the things about online that you know I'm trying to get better at is I have the content and you do the activities and everything, but you don't get me. In the face-to-face -face classes, I do a lot more than I would do online. So I'm trying to learn everything I can to create better online content. But the same thing could go for you. You might be creating a flyer for a church gathering or some kind of uh, fundraiser. There's little tips and tricks to make sure that the people get the information that they need and you don't do the blah, blah, blah within documents. So that's what I want to talk about. How can we create better documents and presentations to get our information across as opposed to the spoken word? Okay, so one of th some of the things we're going to be talking about, we have to understand how the reader is going to view our information. So we do the design process with them in mind. Okay, and that's also where you get very narrow and sometimes you think about the specific audience that you're talking to. Okay, one of the things I'm going to show you is this cool graphic I saw in some training I got here at community college is about the test that they did and they actually tracked the viewers eye movements on a website to see where they were looking when they were trying to get information. It's a, it's a really nice graphic to make sure you understand how that uh, works. I'm going to explain this concept about chunking information, which as it implies is putting information together that is related. Okay, we want to use the KISS method. Keep it short and simple. It used to be keep it simple, stupid, but of course we can't use the word stupid anymore. That would be stupid. All right, hyperlink accessibility. I'm starting to learn about... Um, in one of our shows, we did uh, shows about services we pr provide for handicapped um, students. And one of the software packages that they demonstrated was a reader so that when a person that has uh, visual problems goes to a website, the reader is reading everything, including how the reader interprets hyperlinks and makes it sound to the person listening. There's some things you can do to make it sound better and not so choppy. Okay, web content accessibility, again, related to those kinds of activities. All right, so here's the first thing. When you design documents, you're thinking of the letter F, okay? And that's related to the eye tracking. This is a generalization that eye tracking visualization shows that readers often read websites or documents in an F fashion. So usually they'll track the very top of your document first. And you can see how in the very beginning they usually track all the way across the screen. Then, of course, they start scanning downward. And occasionally they'll pop back into the document. Okay, so in general that looks like the letter F. And so here's the graphic that I really wanted to show you. So this is where they put sensors on, on the uh, person and they could actually track the movement of their eyeballs exactly where they were looking. Okay, so a little bit of graphic. The red, so we have red areas. These are three different websites. Okay, the red is where the person or people that were being tested looked most often. The yellow indicates where they looked, but not as often as in the red. The blue was the most, uh, the least amount of views. And notice the one where it says gray. Anything that is in gray means that it did not track the, the reader's attention at all, and they didn't even move their eyeballs into that. Okay, so look at that. And that's where you kind of, again, see that F pattern. Okay, a little bit of an F pattern there. All right, so for us and for me as an online instructor, the way that I provide information is I'm doing documents like this all the time, whether it's through email, I do discussion boards, I send them documents, as opposed to the spoken word that I might do in a classroom. So if I'm sending documents with a ton of information like that, what's happening, of course, is the student is not going to read it and get the information that I want them to get. So we have some things that we have to worry about. So what does it mean for me on the design side and maybe for you if you're doing things of this nature? First thing is you have to come to this realization. They're just not going to read the document. Okay, you took all your time and you thought you were very thoughtful and came up with all the things that you wanted to do and you, you created this well, you know, well worded document but you have to come to the realization they're just not going to read it. That's just the way it is. Okay, so what does that mean for some design options here? 
remember our F pattern, okay? So usually the person will read that top part and look at it pretty well from left to right. So you usually try to put the most, inf most important information at the top. So I started to do that with my projects. One of the main things that I put at the top of projects is I'll put how many points the project is worth, and of course I'll put that due date. And I'll put it right at the top where they can get it immediately. Okay, the beginning of sentences or sections, you've got to put something in there that grabs the reader's attention. So we want to put some in information there that grabs their attention immediately and not unnecessary information that, of course, they're going to skip over anyway. All right, try just, this is kind of like in related to a resume. When you create your resume, you use action verbs about what is the specific activity that you did in that particular job. Okay, so examples. If I want them to send, submit it, send it, open this, download this, do this, do that. Okay, something that's going to grab their attention immediately and don't put it in a full sentence that says, this project is going to be due on money. You just put due date and you put the date. All right, once again, keep it simple. Use chunking as we've described. So now let's take a look. And I'm going to give you a little bit of tips on bullet usage. We want to use bullets uh, to draw people's attention. All right, so chunking, you're kind of trying to do it like an outline where you put important information together. So you prioritize the information. Okay, what is the most important information? Again, that's going to go towards the top. Okay, much like an outline. All right, design for working memory. So working memory is a little bit like short-term memory. I've been, again, doing some reading and research on that, some you know, researchers, it's pretty much the same thing, short-term memory, working memory. Um, to me, it's kind of different. It's that memory where I'm holding information for a moment, and in a second, I'm going to need to act upon that information, right? I'm going to do some work with the information that I have. So the information that I'm giving to the student, if I overload that working memory, they're going to forget things that I wanted them to remember. So you have to keep it, you know, in smaller chunks. Okay, less is more. Don't overload them in any particular document. Okay, usually information and the memory are inverse. So the more information you try to give them at one time, the less they're going to remember. You keep the information nice and straightforward, and they're most likely going to remember most of what you want them to remember. Okay, and again, this has been a phrase for a long time. A picture is worth a thousand words. If there's some kind of activity or something we want to portray and get across to the user, and if we have a picture that will demonstrate that, don't make them read a big paragraph. Just put the picture. All right, short paragraphs and use a lot of white space. So I've been doing this a little bit more, and you can see there's a lot of documents where they try to cram so much information and maybe create it all on one page that they reduce the vertical white space. So I've been trying to, as I go through each document in my online or even my face-to-face -face classes, if I'm going to hand them out, I've been trying to increase that white space. In Microsoft Word, I showed you a technique called um, expanded space in the font group where you can expand the space between paragraphs ever so slightly or between bullets. Give the person some visual and separate it out. Okay, short lines of text. You know, can I get a tweet tweet? So just like the app, tweets are short number of characters. So when I'm giving information, keep it simple, right? We're not trying to necessarily all the time write full sentences and, you know, write a book for the student. Okay, formatting is very important. Formatting is used to draw the reader's attention to important information. Okay, so like I've done here, I've bolded this so it stands out from the rest. And just those three commands could be used very effectively. Uh, the B, the I, the U, we've talked about in Word and Excel. That's bold, italicize, and underline. Use it to help the student. One of the things that I, I know that students do is if I have them type something and I put double quotes around it, I know when they type it, I'm going to get the double quotes. So they'll put in a web address and, I'm, and they'll say, it's not going to this website. 
and I'm assuming they understand that you don't do that, but of course you, you can't. So I've been taking those double quotes off and just underlining things so I can show where it starts and stops. Okay, but be careful. If someone gives you medicine, there's a specific amount you should be taking. Don't overtake it or it's going to defeat the purpose. Okay, and then we want a little bit of tips on bullets and numbering, which is, again, trying to do some formatting to draw the reader's attention and get them to specific spots. All right, here's some things that you think that this is one of the things like bulleting. Of course I know bulleting. It's very straightforward. We have lines of text and we put bullets on it. But again, there's much more that I can learn that's helping me create the bulleted list so that it is effectively read by my students. First of all, the difference between bullets and numbering. All right, so the first thing we want to make sure that we differentiate about bullets and numbering is we should only use numbering if a sequence is involved, if there are specific steps that I need to do in order. Step one, do this. Step two, do this. Then I should definitely use numbering. If it's just a generalized list of, of things, then bullets tell me. So even the symbols I'm using are portraying something to the reader. All right, this one I didn't really think about. I want to try to use similar lengths. So I have a document here that gives us a sample of that. Okay, so this sample, if you want to come in just a little bit so we can see it, both of these lists are about packing something for the camping trip. So again, this might be for a Boy Scout leader or maybe a high school thing, something we're doing. So we, you know, we provide information. My son's about to go on uh, regionals for golf tournaments, so he's got to pack all this stuff. So there's lots of people that create information like this, and they could use this information to make sure they create the documents properly. If you look here, one of the things they have to take is a bathing suit for our outing to the waterfalls. Okay, so what we're trying to do here is in this document, we don't further explain things like this. Waterproof jacket for rainy days. We are expecting heavy thunderstorms. That's extraneous information also. So what we do is we cut all that out. Here's what you need to bring. Sleeping bag, bathing suit, sunblock, waterproof jacket. We, don't, we leave off all that extra information unless it's absolutely pertinent. Obviously, why, <coughs> why are you bringing a bathing suit? Why are you bringing this jacket? It's self-explanatory. During the presentation, maybe, that I'm giving to the people, then I further explain the bulleted items, but I don't clog up my document with all this extra space. Remember, what's going to happen is they're going to start reading, and they won't go out here, and they won't read it anyway. So we don't need to put it. We want to keep it short and sweet. All right, Consens consistent sentence structure. So that means <coughs> the difference of the, you know, how we use the English language. So let's get another example for that. Okay, so this is about following the park rules. Please follow the park, park rules. Okay, so here they used a verb, then they have a noun, then they have a noun, then they have a pronoun. Okay, so they're using all sorts of different parts of the English language. Instead, what we've done down here is we've restructured those lines so that they are all verbs. Okay, put trash, don't make loud noises, uh, stand inside, pitch in. Okay, again, extraneous information. Why don't you want to create loud noises? Because there's animals at night. We don't need to tell them that. The rule is we're not going to make loud noises. We're not going to do this. So every single one of those bulleted items starts with a verb and we're consistent throughout the list. And these are some of the things that I'm going to think about as I go through documents I've already created that I use for future online classes or in my other classes. Okay, this is a real bad one that I've seen lots of people do. Okay, so another example of that, avoiding the same word over and over and over and over again. Okay, so here they're talking about they're going to pick some pineapples and here's how you do it. So they say, give it, give it, give it. Okay, well we don't need that word give. Okay, we're going to smell it, we're going to squeeze it, whatever we have to do. I even think on some of these sentences we could even cut it down more, again, without that extraneous. So 
it says look at it the color should be golden brown so I'm I would have rephrased this too I would say look at it uh, golden yellow color instead again not those full sentences keeping it as simple as possible and anything that's self-explanatory we don't have to put in okay we discussed formatting what we can do with formatting <coughs> okay so some of this is opinionated so when you create a bulleted list usually a bulleted list is not full sentences sometimes depending on the example of course it is going to be a full sentence so there's you know a decision on whether you want to punctuate full sentences if I put those in a bulleted list I usually do not punctuate them uh, but perhaps now I might but again we want to be consistent if my list is full sentences then I probably want to use full sentences on each of those okay if not then then I don't have to use the punctuation so for instance on this next one if you use fragments like I've been using here we don't we don't put any punctuation on fragments so I don't have a period or anything like that all right then there's also some discussion about if it's a list of like items um, maybe a kindergarten teacher is creating a list of the you know they have supplies that they want the students to have the first day crayons scissors uh, tape glue those are such small items that I mean they're not uh, pronouns so usually something that, like that I will not capitalize but if it's in a blurb of words I will capitalize the first letter okay so again some of this is opinionated so it depends on your particular example all right and again like we were talking about the formatting with the bold the italicized the underline we don't want to get crazy with it I see a lot of students at the college and they go crazy with the highlighter and usually they're highlighting words that are already bold in their textbook so they're just using their highlighter everywhere so I don't know what the purpose is the purpose of the highlighter is to show you know very important information that as they go through their notes or their book they're gonna take a look at it again but if you're highlighting everything what's important now the whole page is important if you go crazy so be careful with that don't overuse it and then when do we create the bulleted list we shouldn't try to bullet everything so some of these suggestions I'm not going to go out and bullet every document I have usually if it's in a list I want to have at least three items in the list if it's just two items then I'll just put it inside the paragraph but if it's three or more that may be the time to start bulleting so all the items won't be you know swimming with the rest of the text in a paragraph uh, and then I'm going to start following those other rules. One last suggestion that they had that I did not put in the PowerPoint presentation that I thought was kind of humorous is they say to keep your language at a reading level of an eighth grader. Uh, my son's in 10th grade right now and he still hangs out with some of those same friends and I don't think I can do it. I've heard them talk to each other and I would have to learn a completely new language to keep it at their level. So I'm going to have to work on that one. By the way, I mentioned that I'm an online instructor and Community College has a tremendous amount of online classes and it, that list is growing every day. So if you can't make it down here, then take an online class. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Computer Train. Take those tips and create documents that people can read easily. And we'll see you on the next episode of Computer Train.